Good morning to you all, and you're welcome to the Signpost series webinar. I hope you find you well wherever you are. Uh, the webinar is brought to you by Chagask in association with Dairy Sustainability Ireland, the National Rural Network, and Food Drink Ireland. My name is Pat Murphy, Head of Environment Knowledge Transfer in, in Chagask, sitting in for Mark Gibson while he's taking some well-earned leave. I'm joined today by Noel Meehan. He will be asking the, the questions. Uh, and I'm also joined by uh, Ross Monaghan, soil scientist with Ag Research in New Zealand. And I suppose uh, agriculture in, in Ireland and sustainability in Ireland uh, keep an eye on what's going on in, in New Zealand. And I suspect New Zealand keep a little bit of a, a, an eye uh, on, on what's happening in Ireland. Ross, you're, you're, you're very welcome. Thank you for that introduction. Pat, uh, yes, it's an interesting time here in New Zealand with quite a few pressures on uh, the farming community trying to reduce their impacts on the environment. Uh, I'll just share my screen here. Okay, before we start, uh, and, uh, Noel, you're coming to us from the sunny west of Ireland. Yeah, yeah, um, quite after having a fantastic week of weather um you know, we can't complain now we've, we've had a summer i suppose but we'd like to like for it to extend a little longer i guess okay ross as you were saying the farmers are under a, a great deal of pressure in new zealand and they're kicking back a little bit i think we've seen some reports of of uh, some protests from farmers against some of the environmental measures over the last few weeks Yes, in some of my slides, I'll touch upon the the whirlwind, if that's not too melodramatic, that, that has arrived. And it's really a, a combination of challenges to improve water quality uh, on top of the climate challenges that face us all. Uh, those two, two things together are big, big issues, but there are others as well. Um, okay. Okay, so if you want to fire up your presentation there. Is that coming okay, through? Okay, that perfectly. Okay, we'll we'll leave you to it. And and uh, again, we're delighted to have you with, with us this morning, Ross. And uh, we're look, really looking forward to your presentation. So thanks. Thank you. It's my privilege. I've been a soil scientist with the Ag Research uh, Research Institute. That's one of seven Crown Research Institutes owned by the government. Uh, and I joined Ag Research way back in 1995. So I sort of arrived as things just started to heat up in terms of expectations around farm environmental performance, um, uh, particularly around improved water quality. So that's, that's what I'm gonna focus on in my presentation uh, this morning. Uh, it's, really broken into four parts. There's a bit of context around the issues, uh, the nature of the challenges. And then I just thought I'd describe some of the policy developments that have arrived. Um, some have landed and others are proposed and being debated uh, at the moment. And then the bulk of my talk really is just to focus on some of the practical responses that I think will be helpful uh, for actually trying to make a difference and and to keep continue farming uh, whilst minimising uh, farming's impact on water quality particularly. And then finally, just a short section on uh, my thoughts on some future research needs that are quite pertinent to New Zealand. Okay, Ross, I just, uh, uh, just say to people, we have live transcripts uh, turned on, so if you're annoying you or you don't need it uh, there is a button down on the bottom of the screen on the right hand side of your controls to where you can click and switch off the live transcript and i suppose just to remind people to use the q and a q and a for any questions that that you may have uh, that we can put to, to ross at the end of the presentation so sorry for interrupting you there ross no problem uh just a wee intro to new zealand for those of you who are not familiar uh we're about 27 million hectares, 
I gather we've got a population of 5 million that's quite similar to Ireland. Uh, 27 million sheep down from a peak of 60 odd million in the 90s. Uh, an expanding dairy herd, up to six and a half million dairy cattle now, and four million beef. Our economy is quite dependent on the livestock industry. Um, it's a big chunk of our GDP, uh, and it occupies about 40% of, um, of the land uh, surface area. But just in terms of the nature of that, pastoral estate, it's, our farms have evolved really depending on uh, clover-based pasture. There's a little bit of nitrogen used, mainly on dairy farms. They might use between 100 to 150 kilos of N per hectare per year. Uh, we don't have a lot of off paddock uh, housing of animals, a little bit in dairy that I'll, I'll mention later. Uh, the fertilizers we use are pretty much for nitrogen is urea and we don't have any closed periods for the return of effluents and manures to land it's mostly consented by regional authorities and guided by soil wetness and temperatures another bit of background here is just a snapshot of water quality in new zealand of Got two pictorials from our, our national database. It's the Land, Air, Water, Aotearoa uh, database with the website there. And the two, two I've shown really, the Macro Invertebrate Community Index is regarded as a fairly um, helpful, holistic indicator of ecosystem health. It's shown on the left and on the right is a summary of the E. coli uh, categorization. And I present that there because uh, fecal pollution is, is one of the big concerns for water quality in New Zealand. People want to, to um, bathe, to recreate in our, our surface waters. So it's a topic that uh, keeps coming up at least as frequently as nutrients. The, as you can see, there's a fair bit of red in these graphs. So the general community discussion is that uh, improvement is, is desired to try and reduce those red and orange uh, components of both the MCI index and E. coli levels. Uh, the interesting things for me are, whilst there is quite a bit of orange and red for pasture, uh, compared to urban catchments, it's actually, they're probably in a better state. So there's quite a challenge there in urban catchments too, which is, you know, a useful perspective on this urban rural divide that's mentioned. We've all got our part to play to, uh, to try and make a difference. Another bit of context here is the increase in livestock grazing pressure that uh, is evident when we look back as far as the 70s. Uh, this is data here where I've converted livestock head counts into what we call stock unit equivalents, where approximately uh, one cow equals about six sheep and about two deer. So those counts have been converted, uh, depending on animal, animal productivity, uh, to represent a stock unit equivalent. And one stock unit nominally represents a feed intake of about 6,000 megajoules of ME per year. The, the interesting thing that's apparent here is you can see our, our grazing pressure from the sheep industry peaked in the 80s and has declined as dairy has expanded. Uh, and now dairy and beef cattle actually represent about two thirds of the grazing pressure on our landscape. We do have a bit of deer production, but as you can see the components in the gray on the bars, it's a pretty small percentage of the total. Our pastoral estate is actually decreasing slightly. 
um, from about 11.3 million hectares in 95 to 10.6 million hectares now. When we couple those uh, changes in area and stock unit equivalents, there's been a, an intensification of about or just under 1% per annum. Uh, the other component of that is the mean stocking rates by calculators increased by about 10% between 1995 and 2015. One large piece of work that we recently finished and have published uh, was for a national science challenge, our Air, Land and Water National Science Challenge, where we were tasked with trying to figure out what difference all the management activities, the good practices uh, have made to offset some of the, the intensification I mentioned earlier. And this was actually quite a, uh, a challenging thing to do because we needed to take into account the change in land area, the spread of farming, particularly irrigated dairy farming onto more vulnerable land, the intensification, and set that against all the good practice that uh, has improved over uh, the 20 year period between 95 and 2015 that we used as date stamps. And the long and the short of it for phosphorus uh, leakages, our assessment suggested that we have actually made a difference and at a national extent reduced phosphorus losses by between 20 to 25%. Uh, in the case of nitrogen, as we expected, because of that growing dairy herd, the problems of the dairy urine patch, uh, a lot of that dairy going on to irrigated uh, stony soils, um, the nitrogen leakage had actually increased by about 25%. So all the good improved practices with irrigation, fertilizer, effluent hadn't been enough to offset that uh, those vulnerability uh, changes that I mentioned. Uh, our best ass assessment is that if farmers had done nothing, that 25% would have actually increased to about a 50% increase nationally. So the, uh, the take home message is we've still got a fair way to go to try and wind back some of the leakages that have increased over uh, the last 20 years at least as our farms have intensified and changed where that farming activity has occurred. Uh, those metrics have really fueled the, the public debate um, and have led the governments to try and propose some more stringent targets and actions uh, to try and maintain or improve the quality of, of water. Uh, the overarching uh, policy statement is what we call the National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management. It was uh, re-released in 2020, and it's really setting a more prescriptive directive to regional councils, which are the regional authorities in charge of setting uh, limits and setting guidelines, uh, to be more proactive and to really achieve some of those uh, goals uh, written there in red. So emphasizing the safeguarding of ecosystem processes, indigenous species, such as native fish, uh, safeguarding people's health and maintaining or improving their overall quality of fresh water. Uh, this increase and in more prescriptive approach has arrived at a time when I'm sure like you in Ireland, farming has come under the spotlight in terms of trying to improve uh, or reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. So that combined with the water quality uh, pressure has really led to quite a prescriptive approach. And here I'm showing some of the, the measures that are uh, proposed or implemented 
Um, I won't go through them all, but farm environmental plans will become mandatory, it seems, starting with at risk catchments. We were taken by surprise last year where a limit, an upper limit on nitrogen fertilizer to pastoral farms uh, was set. It took people by surprise, as did things like uh, controls on intensification and more stringent rules for the way we winter animals, particularly on forage crops. And I suspect it's still to be worked out, but I suspect eventually many farms will be trying to manage to in-stream nutrient concentrations within catchments, as complex as that is to, uh, to work through. So these developments are really quite a step up from the more voluntary uh, recommendations and guidelines that we've been used to. As Pat mentioned, uh, this has really created quite a lot of stress in rural communities. Um, the expectations, things arriving at once or close together, uh, people are feeling quite stressed. So last Friday, I was putting a traffic jam as I was heading into Dunedin. We don't often have traffic jams in Dunedin. It's a city of about 100,000 people. Um, but I got caught up in the national protest where farmers came to town in tractors and trucks um, just to register their frustrations. So fair to say there's, there's a lot going on and a lot of challenges ahead. Being an optimist, I, I do think there's a lot we can do practically to uh, to manage those leakages and at least get us on the right trajectory to improvements. Um, so I was just going to share some of my thoughts on uh, what they look like. And I'm going to focus on some of the, the things in the research pipeline that aren't too far away and which are showing reasonable promise and may be relevant to Irish agriculture too. Uh, one of the first categories of improvement, I think, is that continual push for finding better pastures, ones that now include improved environmental attributes. Uh, we've done a lot of work in the last 10 years to show that we can live on less fertilizer nitrogen if we're quite um, targeted with the way we use it. Uh, that work's been published as part of the Pastoral 21 research program, which I'm happy to uh, share details with if, if folk uh, would like to follow up. There's also quite a lot of interest now in the role of more diverse pastures, getting away from just our ryegrass white clover mix. Plantain is one that's the subject of a lot of research activity at the moment, and I'll Go into that in a little more detail in the next couple of slides. Uh, more in winter active pasture species, things like annual ryegrasses that have more cool season growth and nitrogen uptake, and possibly deeper rooting plants such as chicory, plantain, lucerne. Um, it's early days for them, but uh, they are hypothesized to, to potentially deliver um, additional benefit for tightening the nitrogen cycle. The plantain story is an interesting and recent one. I'm not close to this research. I'm really drawing on my colleagues' uh, contributions from research groups around Lincoln and colleagues here at Invermay. Uh, there's a commercially available variety, I think it's called Ecotain, that's been shown to have positive attributes for environmental purposes, uh, and I think it can be divided into three attributes. The first is, it seems as though animals that consume plantain as part of their diet excrete less nitrogen than urine, and that urine is more dilute, so it's spread more evenly. There's also a third effect that is, suggests that there is some, possibly some, biological nitrification inhibition that slows the conversion of ammonium to nitrate, which would also deliver uh, some improved nitrogen efficiencies. 
The research activity today has really been targeted in at leaching reductions. Uh, it's hard to get a feel for what the size of the prize will be at a farm scale. The best guess I, I can get at this point is that we might be looking at something up to a 20 to 30% reduction. But the challenge will be to make sure that the pasture swards have 30% plantain or more um, to ensure that those positive environmental attributes are expressed. My colleague Priscilla Simon here at Invermay has been documenting a co-benefit of having plantain as part of pasture swards. Um, when she combines the measurements of the more dilute urine that's returned, the reduced in excretion per animal, uh, it seems as though the N2O emissions are much reduced for swards where they're getting up to 30 or 45 percent plantain as shown in the bar chart on the right. So that's quite a significant co-benefit to, to describe. The second general area that's where I think we could make some considerable improvements is the way we manage our forage cropping systems. Being from the cooler southern part of New Zealand, forage crops are a fairly common way of wintering cows economically. Uh, we can stand up quite a lot of feed in front of the animals over winter that they, they break feed. Uh, crops of between 10 and 20 tonnes of dry matter per hectare. So it's good economically. The downside is there are a couple of design efficiencies. As you can see, there's pretty much bare soil after the animals have, have finished grazing the crop. And there's very little plant cover and plant uptake of nitrogen until we get a, a following pasture or crop established, which may not be until four or five months later. Some of the research my, Chris, my colleague Chris Smith has been doing at our Southern Dairy Hub research facility just outside in Vicargo is really putting some numbers around the size of those leakages. And we can see that for uh, grazed autumn crops, lifted autumn crops, um, the numbers are sh not close to 100 kilograms of N per hectare. For grazed kale in winter, it's even larger. Uh, and those losses are about five to six times what we measure from uh, pastures that are grazed by the milking herd from spring through to autumn, as shown in the green bar on the right. One of the interesting things we did find was that uh, the fodder beet treatment um, resulted in a much uh, reduced nitrogen leakage to water. Um, when we work the numbers through on a per cow winter basis, uh, choosing a fodder beet crop resulted in about half of the nitrogen leaching as did the grazed kale. One of those effects was due to uh, less nitrogen in the plant, so less protein consumed and excreted, but we suspect there may also be something happening due to the high uh, sugar content of that crop, there may be some removal of nitrate in the soil as well under that fodder beet treatment. Colleagues, particularly around Lincoln, Brenda Malcolm, Peter Carey, uh, have done a lot of work on trying to reduce the, the duration of bare soil following the grazing of those winter crops. So planting catch crops such as oats or triticale to get them in the ground as quickly as possible and try and soak up some of their excreted urinary nitrogen. Uh, I'm not close to the research, but there is quite a bit of interest in reduced tillage techniques to see if they can provide more strength, armor the soil more to, to maintain structure and infiltration and reduce overland flow and sediment loss risk. Uh, project that I'm involved, a three-year project, we've just almost through our first winter. Um, it's 
it's a soil armor project whereby in a way it's going back to the future and seeing if some of our older techniques of pasture-based wintering uh, are going to be feasible approaches and there are hypotheses here uh, that one if we can keep uh, a growing plant alive and not damaged so that it can leap away when things warm up in spring that will be providing a catch crop on its own. Uh, a key part of this treatment actually is the the hay that's provided. The cows tear the bales to pieces and eat about two thirds of it. Uh, the remaining one third, the farmers uh, comment that they, the cows actually love that remaining one third to lie on. So it's quite a loafing area, just reducing the pressure on the swards. Um, so this farmer where we're doing this trial, he's sold on the idea and uh, we're trying to document the, the size of the leaching loss between those two treatments. That's the soil armor treatment on the left and the traditional kale treatment on the right, which as you can see, um, we traditionally well, usually create quite a lot of mud. Infrastructure will probably be required for some parts of New Zealand where we have heavy soils and particularly wet, slow draining. Uh, what that type of infrastructure will, uh, will look like in the future, I'm not sure. The traditional barns are regarded as quite expensive, so there's quite a, a desire to see if we can find something more affordable um, that can be used on and off if um, sometimes we get good runs of weather and uh, it's quite good to have the cows out of, um, out of the shelter. One area where I do, another area where I think we can make uh, an improvement is the way we manage our vulnerable landscapes. Um, I do feel that some of our critical source areas uh, could be managed better. We're getting better now at identifying where they are. Uh, my colleague Mitchell Donovan has done a lot of this work on geospatial mapping of critical source areas. And the goal here really is to try and make sure that we avoid some of those potentially high impact activities as shown in the, the orange bar on the far right, the winter forage cropping activity in particular on areas where we map is uh, quite susceptible erosion as per the red and orange markings on the, the farm map on the left. A uh, key part of the modeling that Mitchell has done has really been to incorporate a lot of the treading damage aspects of uh, grazing and incorporate that into the revised universal soil loss equation and develop that in a geospatial mapping framework. So things like stock type grazing history and grazing intensity are, are things that we know are really important to that level of treading damage and consequent sediment loss risk. This is a field site of Mitchell's in um, southern New Zealand. Uh, hopefully in the future we will be looking after those areas in orange, uh, those critical source areas and quantifying how how much we can reduce losses by by nursing and protecting critical source areas. We've done this on dairy systems on equivalent terrains and shown that on off grazing, ideally keeping out of those gullies altogether can make quite large improvements and reductions in sediment and pea losses. And then finally, another area where I think we can, or we will see probably uh, a change in farming impact is the move to some alternative land uses. Uh, there's quite a lot of trees being planted around New Zealand, including on dairy farms, either for riparian protection, for woodlots, for carbon credits, for biodiversity. Uh, some parts of New Zealand are also moving into avocado, kiwi fruit, a little bit of specialty seeds. Um, 
perhaps crops such as hemp. And there is there are a couple of fledgling small ruminant milking industries, uh, dairy sheep on the left and dairy goats. Um, my colleague Dinah Selby has been involved in trying to benchmark the nitrogen uh, flows and impacts from those two industries. And they seem to stack up as certainly a lower nitrogen impact for at-risk catchments where nitrogen management is critical. In my concluding part of my talk, I will just finish on some thoughts on where I think we, we need to focus their research. Uh, the plantain and catch crop ideas, I think they're based on sound principles, good proof of concept. The challenge now is really to see how effective they can be at a farm scale and whether there are any other attributes, either positive or negative, that we need to be thinking about. For our wets, wetter, heavier soils, sloping terrains, I do think somehow we've got to be able to make sure that that improved understanding and geospatial mapping that we've got can guide better decisions about mapping critical source areas and ensuring that those areas are protected, either not grazed at all, or at least if, um, if they need to be grazed, they are protected by limiting grazing duration. And then finally, I, I still think there's a lot to do with the old chestnut of the, the urine patch. Uh, even with some of the good measures that are in place at the moment, the nitrogen surpluses in the urine patch still are very large. That's where most of the nitrogen is, is being lost from New Zealand pastures. I won't go through all of these options here, other than to say uh, there is a bit of a suite of activity uh, focusing on those four general strategies of either trying to ensure less nitrogen is excreted, excreted nitrogen is captured or recycled more efficiently in the field, either by capturing or applying some sort of treatments. Uh, lots of green and orange, so I'm optimistic that uh, collectively there will be a few more tools in the toolbox which will help make a difference uh, in the next five to ten years. Uh, as I alluded to in my earlier slides, I think infrastructure will be required for particularly some farms on heavier soils. So we do, barns are quite costly. Um, it will be a challenge, but worthwhile endeavor to see if we can find more affordable standoff options that provide comfortable clean surfaces and yet capture those excretal nutrients that um, if deposited in the field uh, represent a, a risk to water quality. So some final remarks just to conclude. Uh, it's a fairly tough time to be a farmer in New Zealand. Our rural communities are under stress because there is a lot of environmental policy and legislation either landing or proposed that does have big implications uh, for farming activity. On an optimistic note, I would say that there is a lot we can do actually in terms of implementing what we know now to be effective and there are some promising things coming through the research pipeline. Uh, there are some design inefficiencies to be overcome but if we target at those, on, I think there are gains to be achieved. But one thing I haven't mentioned at all really is uh, this issue of fecal pollution. Uh, our knowledge, as I understand it, I'm talking to my colleague Richard Muirhead, uh, is that there's a lot of basic science still to be done and incorporated into practical systems and tools that can can guide practices to make sure we reduce fecal transport and surface runoff and help improve swimming water quality. And then finally, I do think 
trying to make sure we match what we do on land to the suitability of that land as defined by its growth potential, but also its vulnerability to environmental losses uh, as an area where we can make big improvements for probably much lesser cost than, than rushing to some expensive mitigations. So with that, I'll conclude and I'm happy to take any questions if, if anyone has any. Okay, thank you very much. You might just stop sharing your, your presentation. That's great. Uh, uh, yeah, there's a, a number of questions coming in. Um, I suppose just to, to uh, start, to, just to get to, uh, again a little bit more on the context side, you showed the, the, the graph of um, water quality with the red, orange, green, uh, was there a fourth color? Uh, yellow, I think. Um, uh, we, and we do have a, a similar system of, of uh, displaying our, our river water qualities here. What is the target that you're trying to achieve in that, in, in that context? from in the agricultural areas? Well, for one of them is swimmability and that is, it's based on quite a complex numerical framework, but one of the key metrics, if I understand correctly, is uh, the 95 percentile of E. coli should be less than 540 CFUs per 100 mil. Um, so I think, Excellent and good is good enough. Uh, and it's basically a, a matter of increasing risk thereafter. And it's a little bit it's a little bit hard to get your head around, or it is for me anyway, in that the the fecal pollution risk is really based on a, a correlation between E. coli and Campylobacter. Uh, it's confounded by including both high and low flow sample events. Um, so it's, it's perhaps uh, in that sense a qualitative score, but the general picture is the state is, is poorer than the community would like it to be. Okay, so getting them, getting them all or most of them up to the, 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 high, the excellent or the high standard is, is where you ultimately want to be. That, that's the, certainly the community aspiration. Um, I think the industries would say maybe that's that's not a sensible thing to do everywhere. Uh, maybe that's maybe we can be more targeted as to where those higher goals are sought. So catchments where people do actually use them. Um, but yeah, that's as if I understand it, that's a, an ongoing community discussion and limit setting process. Our just reminder to everybody to, that are, to use the questions and answers for your questions. No number of questions coming in there. Yeah, a number of questions, but um, I suppose just one for myself maybe first before we before we go to those. Um, I suppose it, you you referenced there the the statement, the environment statement, and the water statement from the New Zealand government and how the um, the powers have been devolved to the regional uh, councils or regional region areas in, in New Zealand. Um, how do you feel that is working? Um, having that, that we say, you know, every region is is doing their own, coming up with their own plan and doing their own. I won't say their own thing. Okay, there's an overarching policy guidance document there, but ultimately they're they're they go and, and draw up their own plans. Are we finding some councils going a little bit harder than others, or, or how how is it working? Yeah, that that is a good question. No, um, if I was being honest. It's it's a mixture of good and bad, I would say. Um, one of the one of the problems we have with every council going under their own sort of uh, trajectory is big councils or big authorities have much more resourcing than small ones, so they can do a much more rigorous job of taking communities with them, uh, backing things up with science. Um, so yeah, that's a, that is a real issue. Some councils are much further down the track simply because of the better resourcing, um, and have set quite, uh, quite clear 
nitrogen limits in particular. Uh, so it's a bit of a mixed bag. The theory was that um, the people in the region should know their region their best and thus be able to, to navigate those community discussions of how good things should be. And that's fine in principle, but it does need to sort of be resourced uh, equally, I suppose. Okay, yeah. fair enough. Um, I suppose a lot of the questions that have come in is around the plantain. Um, you know, I suppose really uh, there's, a, there's a lot of research obviously going on in, in New Zealand, but also here in Ireland. And I suppose the questions are around, you know, uh, the establishment of plantain in the sward and, and chicory as well. Has that got a role to play? Um, you know, is it done through a full reseed or is it stitched in? Or, you know, what, what, what's the persistency of the, of the um, plantain in, in, the, in the spores like? And um, I suppose, you know, basically, is it, is it a, a real viable alternative or a solution for uh, capturing that, that nitrogen and, and replacing it? Yes. Um, I'll have a go at what I see and hear from the farming community, I, but I would acknowledge my colleagues, uh, particularly those at DRNZ or at Lincoln University, uh, Ina Pinksterhouse and um, Dave Chapman, uh, they've had quite a, a little bit more direct experience than I, but the perspective I hear is that those benefits are there if they can get the proportions 30% uh, or greater and they can sustain that. Um, at the moment, what I hear from farmers stitching it in or going full cultivation is they can't get it for long. Um, and it, it doesn't persist, but there may be ways to manage around that through, I don't know, strips or whatever. Um, but fair to say that is probably the biggest impediment to achieving the benefits is just to make sure we can keep it in there long enough. Um, and I, I, aren't... Is there much, uh, sorry for going across here, Ross, is there much kind of research in, going on with regard to, like we, we know it has benefits, but I suppose around the, the systems, the grazing, how you incorporate into grazing systems and, you know, grazing rotation and that kind of thing. Is there, is there any research going on in New Zealand around that area? Yes, I, not, I'm not involved in it directly myself, but uh, Dave Chapman and his team at Lincoln, I know they've commissioned quite a lot of investment where they're trying to step up from proof of concept and plot trials to, to grazing system comparisons. They've, uh, a colleague of mine has made the bold commitment to try and measure the leaching losses under those grazing systems. Um, but that's that's quite a big challenge in itself, but that's where it's at. So it's probably still three to five years away before we'll have good farmlet scale comparisons that would give us a better estimate of the size of the prize. I think you referenced at the very start or the outset that um, currently it, it's a very much a, a, a ryegrass clover mix, is that correct? In the grazing out there? Yes, yeah, that's that's really been our backbone for as long as I can remember. There's a bit of lucerne around, but that's not suited to every environment. Um, yeah, the the other diet, major part of our diet, are those forage crops I touched upon for winter mainly. Yeah. Question in there in relation to, uh, I suppose, the mixes here that we would be seeing in multi-species sward would include chicory. Is there any work done or any uh, chicory involved in the in the uh, seed mixes there? I know colleagues further north, particularly up around Palmerston North, have done work on chicory. It's not one I hear about a lot. Maybe it's less relevant to the cooler south here. Um, so it's not one that I would consider okay. to be a common species in our mixes, um, but in, uh, yeah. So I was moving back to the the clover um, in terms of the uh, I suppose leaching of of nitrogen from clover. Uh, is, are there concerns 
say at the back end of the year that you have a lot of, of nitrate stored within the clover and potential losses at the back end, or is that something that has been quantified? Well, my colleague Stuart Lidgard has done quite a, a bit of work looking at the that's the nitrogen cycle as driven by either clover mainly or uh, various combinations of additional fertilizer. The general understanding we have is that the source of the nitrogen, whether it's clover or whether it's fertilizer, doesn't really matter. Uh, once it goes through the animal, um, the leakage risk is really dependent on the total flux. So the nitrogen excreted uh, irrespective of source. One an important point though, is that Stuart would say that because clover in a way is sort of self-limiting, uh, we don't see clover swords pumping in lots of nitrogen as you can sometimes see on irrigated farms where fertilizer is readily available. They can easily push up over two, 300 units of in which you wouldn't get with clover alone. Just, just on the on the clover there, uh, a very specific question: How big of an issue has the has uh, eelworm attacks on clover been um, in New Zealand? Is, is that a problem? Oh, it's not one I've heard about. We we have been worried about the clover root weevil, which has gradually made its way south and is, I think, pretty much widespread around New Zealand. Um, but the, the concern seems to have abated. It seems modern clovers have tolerated and adapted. Um, it's an issue, but I couldn't tell you the, the economic damage it's still incurring, but it seems to have died down a little of concern. There's a, a question here in relation to the, I suppose, the integrated assessment of mitigation uh, measures across multiple dimensions, water quality, gaseous emissions and biodiversity, and looking for synergies and, and antagonisms a, a, across these dimensions. Yes. Um, tell me if I'm getting off track, but I, the, I think it's an important thing we need to be better at is describing the full sort of system consequences of any change of technology or practice uh, because, because we're managing two big topics, water quality and um, consequences for greenhouse gas emissions. We are, well, without wanting to sound overconfident, we have been, <laughs> reasonably well served here in New Zealand with our overseer nutrient cycling model. It was engineered to, to provide a nutrient budget to begin with, uh, to provide an estimate of nutrient leakage. And it also had a framework for calculating on-farm greenhouse gas emissions. So I think that that tool is pretty widely accepted as the best we've got to cope with those sort of farm scale considerations. Uh, it always could be better, of course, and we need those process-based modelers, the EPSOM users, to really be guiding us as to how some of these new technologies would behave under those types of modeling frameworks. Uh, a question in relation to, uh, I suppose, back onto water, uh, the extent to which you have issues with phosphorus as opposed to nitrogen, are there areas of the country where it's a problem or is it, uh, you, you seem to say you're getting improvements in, in, in phosphorus as the issue of being resolved. Uh, is it now down to nitrogen or are there still significant uh, issues with phosphorus? Yeah, I think it's fair to say, if I understand my colleagues correctly, there are still lots of catchments where phosphorus is actually probably the biggest concern where the most bang for buck could be achieved. At a national extent, the, the summary seem to be saying that we have seen improvements in DRP in the national database. Uh, so it's, it's on a trajectory that's good. 
Um, but uh, what was else? There was another, but that sort of, that data trajectory tied in with their national assessment that I mentioned earlier. So it sort of gave us a little bit of confidence that um, those farm practices had improved. I do think the next thing that'll help with their phosphorus losses, at least here in New Zealand, is to make sure that we we manage soils to minimise that treading damage and the phosphorus runoff that we do see when soils are uh, treaded and infiltration is reduced. Um, so with good practice, I'm hopeful that we can keep that good trajectory with phosphorus, but there, will, there are catchments remaining that, that do need a lot of um, focus for phosphorus. Um, so just uh, just another question in here um, about one of your charts mentioning the treatment of urine patches. Uh, so maybe could you expand on that as to what would be used to treat those urine patches or what are you working on there? Yes. Um, so there's still a bit of interest in process inhibitors. Uh, I'm not close to that research, but I hear from my colleagues at Lincoln and even up in Ruakura that uh, chemical additives are being researched. Um, obviously, you probably know about the DCD story here. There's a lot of energy spent on that, but because of market uh, preferences, it was pulled as an option. Um, there's a machine that's been developed, I think it's called Spikey, which uh, I'm not exactly sure how how far or how successful it is at, as yet, but it's uh, been mentioned as a, a tool that can identify urine patches in the field. Presumably, if that works well enough, uh, some of those process inhibitors could be applied specifically to those patches rather than being broadcast. The other thing that is of interest to me is that photo I showed you about the hay treatment. I suspect there might be a bit of immobilization of urinary nitrogen just long enough to get us through the winter uh, and retain or keep nitrogen out of the leaching pathway. So that's another idea that I think has got legs, but we, we're just really getting underway this. Yes. Um, there's been a bit of work done by Brendan Malcolm uh, at Lincoln who sh showed that uh, straw additions to, well, in this case, muddy soils with urine, that was another option. So basically getting carbon in with the urine. Um, it's probably a, a more natural approach than some of the chemical additives that are being looked at. There's a, a question here. Uh, have you found a direct link between end loss and, and farm stocking rate, or is soil type a more dominant factor? So I suppose there's always the, the question between is is it soil type that we need to, to manage or, or to keep down the, the, the stocking rate, or which trumps the other? Yeah, the, the stocking rate relationship has been kicked around a lot here. And my take on it anyway is that uh, it's, it's not so, many, so much a metric of number of cows per hectare, but more the amount of nitrogen consumed or nitrogen down the throat. That's the primary driver of excretion and thus leaching risk. And then soil type is the modifier of how much of that excreted in sticks around available to be lost. Um, does that does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. so yeah, yeah uh, a, a general question here: How is dairy farm farming uh, being perceived by the the wider community in, in New Zealand? Well, I it's it's a mixed perspective, I think. Particularly since COVID, I think people have really realised that New Zealand is quite dependent on our farmers. Um, they have sailed on through the, the crisis and uh, doing important stuff, keeping the economy ticking. So 
it's this difficult discussion of recognizing how important those farming activities are for our, our well-being, but also not shying away from the difficult discussions that we do have some quite important challenges ahead. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's quite a tricky stage of, of having those difficult discussions without dividing up into sort of Republican and Democrat types of um, exchanges, if you know what I mean. Uh, we do. Uh, there's just another question, very kind of specific one again, is around, um, you know, with genetics and, and breeding and so on, is, is there any work going into uh, identification of low greenhouse gas sires through genetics? Yes, my colleagues actually at uh, the campus in Verme where I work, uh, they've done quite a lot with sheep and they're just building calorimeters for dairy stock. Um, and I think the story for sheep, if I understand correctly, is it has been a very profitable thing to do. Uh, just that continual incremental improvement uh, in genetic potential has made a big difference over over the decade scales that become quite meaningful. And they're assuming that the same is possible with uh, the cows. Um, there is actually a research program underway. They're probably about halfway through called the Low End Sires uh, program where they're trying to identify uh, genetic markers that, uh, that deliver less in excretion. Now, I'm just not sure how successful they've been, but um, it's, it's only because I'm not close to it, but it's certainly being looked at. Okay. So a, a question here in relation to, uh, and I was asking for an opinion uh, related to potential areas where uh, improvements in, in nitrates isn't delivered, will more draconian action be, be, be taken in those areas? Yeah. Uh, I... I don't know. I suspect it'll be probably a catchment by catchment basis almost. Um, it's some communities have a much stronger urban voice and others a much stronger rural voice, which counts for that limit setting process. So if, if there are catchments where leakages are high, but they're not draining to sensitive estuaries or those nitrogen losses are not resulting in harmful in stream consequences, they'll probably tolerate more. And I think that's a sensible way to go, but it's, it's a bit of an unknown to me um, how long it'll take us to, to work that through. Okay. Well, listen, I think we've come to the end of our time. That's been really enlightening, uh, Ross, and I think it's challenged us in a, a, a number of directions to, to think about how we, we do things. Uh, and I suppose we have generally had a, a one-size-fits-all approach here in Ireland, and that's something which I suppose there's a, 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 some questions being asked about. So it's always good to get a perspective from, from down under, uh, and we really appreciate you taking the time on your Friday evening when you might be doing something more more enjoyable to, to, to join us here and 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 uh, discuss issues with us. So we really appreciate it and, and thanks again. Uh, finally, then before we leave, I'd like to thank our production team of Andy Boland and, and Yvonne Marr. Uh, next week we'll be joined by Fergal Monaghan uh, uh, to discuss the Hen Harrier project and it's a landscape approach uh, to results-based agri-environment payment schemes. So uh, enjoy the good weather until then, and uh, hopefully we'll see you again this time next week. So thanks to you for joining us, and, and goodbye. Thanks, Pat. My pleasure. <laughs>